recording started. Okay, ready? Let's do it. All right. Um, well, welcome everybody. This is the Annie Research Work Group, um, and we are very excited to welcome um, Laura Anderko and her guests. And I'll let uh, Laura um, introduce her guests. Um, but we're going to be talking about Fukushima compound disaster and the implications for nursing practice. Um, so, Laura, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Barb. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We're uh, delighted to be here, and um, I just want to give a little context. Um, I, uh, I uh, heard Erico's presentation with the Kennedy Institute uh, of Ethics at Georgetown a couple months ago. Actually, Emma, my center manager at the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, had the opportunity to hear her speak about her research um, Post Fukushima, and apparently there's another way to say it, Fukushima. Yeah. So either way, I'm told is correct. So I'm going to go with the way I am familiar with, um, and it was um, quite uh, informative and um, frankly startling. And uh, so um, Erico and I have been um, in uh, conversations about sharing this uh, information with nurses and. Um, her uh, partner, um, Christopher Eddy, um, is also joining us, uh, who has a background uh, in public health and will be talking about nursing implications, which will be uh, delightful for those of us who are nurses, and um, has a long um, uh, history and experience in the public health world. And um, in deference to time, I'm just going to uh, leave it at that, unless there's anything else you two want to share. Okay. So, um, and we are hoping to uh, turn this information into uh, an article for the AJN column. Uh, and Barb and I have communicated about that. Thank you, Barb. And um, we'll, uh, we'll get uh, ready with uh, our outline and such um, following this webinar. So any questions or comments you have will be particularly helpful to us. And Katie, I don't know if there's any way to save those comments. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, those of you that know me uh, know that um, I'm uh, director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment and uh, am always delighted to partner with Annie and um, uh, feels like my second home when I when I uh, I'm with Katie and we're doing work uh, with Annie. So um, next slide, please. So today's content um, I'm not going to go through uh, each one of these, but it provides a context for uh, what we'll be talking about today. We're going to provide a very a, a fifty thousand foot view of disasters in the U.S. Um, we will do uh, an interview, excuse me, an overview um, of uh, Fukushima. Erica, Erica will be going through uh, sort of the wake-up call for an all-hazards approach. Um, she's going to talk also about qualitative research uh, with a human rights-based approach um, uh, and some of the voices uh, from the victims. Uh, we're going to look at... Um, nursing's uh, specific actions in the Fukushima disaster and um, also implications for nursing practice is what Chris will be speaking about. And uh, finally, I'll wrap it up with an all-hazards planning and response approach to uh, in the U.S. so uh, we don't leave hopeless. <laughs> Next slide, please. So today's objectives will be to learn about the human rights-based approach to um, health and responses to large-scale disasters, the all-hazards disaster theory and major disaster types, um, hazard vulnerability assessment, or HVA, and a focus on expected consequences shared among disaster types in your community. Next slide, please. So um, we're all familiar with the recent disasters. Uh, we had three hurricanes um, in the fall. We had uh, numerous wildfires 
Um, since 2007, we've had over 1,000 U.S. disasters. Uh, nearly 26 million Americans were impacted by the three hurricanes in the, in the fall, which included Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And in Hurricane Harvey, uh, the picture on the far left shows folks um, gathering samples um, from people post uh, Hurricane Harvey uh, to look at chemical exposures uh, that occurred from a flooded plant. And you may or may not have heard that there were 13 Superfund sites that were inundated as a result of the flooding from Hurricane Harvey. Next slide, please. Um, this is a new diagram uh, put out by EPA. I won't go through all of it, but it provides a context for the number of um, hazards that can occur simultaneously. Uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about is, um, uh, particularly with Fukushima, it wasn't just an earthquake, it wasn't just a tsunami, and it wasn't just a, a nuclear uh, event um, uh, from their power plant. These all occur, occurred together. And so unless we think about the um, totality of what might occur at any given point in time, we're really not prepared. Next slide, please. So are we prepared and what is our role as uh, a profession? Next slide, please. And I hand it off to Erico. Thank you, Dr. Anderko. Mm -hmm. My name is Erico Sase. Mm -hmm. I have a PhD in health science. I teach and research health and human rights. Today, my co-presenter, Mr. Chris Eddy, and I are excited to share our seven-year research project with our respected nurses. In our presentation, Fukushima Compound Disaster Implication for Nursing Practice. Before, we'd like to make a disclosure that today's presentation is a part of ongoing project, and some articles are currently under review. Fukushima research and trips were self-funded unless otherwise noted. The views of this webinar do not represent the affiliating institutions. Graphics may be disturbing to some audience. Audience discretion is advised. The magnitude 9 earthquake hit Japan at 2.46 p.m. on March 11th. Large aftershocks followed. Next, please. A series of tsunami hit northeast Japan soon after, and it sucked everything. The flammable chemicals in the tsunami water burned the whole city in northeast Japan. Next slide, please. Then followed a series of explosions of nuclear plant. It is designa designated at level 7, which is the same as the Chernobyl accident. Next, please. Over 22,000 persons lost their lives, 92% by drowning. Over 6,000 people were injured. Next slide, please. Nearly a half a million buildings and houses were damaged. Financial damage is estimated up to 208 billion US dollars. Next, please. Given this state, we investigated the right to health in the post-disaster in Japan. Today, I will share a summary of the book chapter published by the Oxford University Press. Next, please. First, the right to health is the right to the highest attainable standard of health stated in the World Health Organization's institution, constitution. Next, please. A human rights-based approach examines equalities in healthcare systems by understanding the situation's availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality of healthcare services, goods, and so forth. Next, please. As an example of enhancing the availability of healthcare, approximately 7,000 personnel have been dispatched to the affected areas during six months. Next, please. However, 78% hospitals were destroyed and health provider shortage was worsened 
to 178.7 physicians per 100,000 population after the disaster. This ratio is lower than the lowest one in the United States in Mississippi. Next, please. For the challenges of quality health care, on your right hand, about 5% of the elderly inpatients died during the in evacuation or at the shelters. Next, please. Given these issues, I was commissioned to study a human rights-based approach to health after two years from the compound disaster. Next, please. The right to health in the post-nuclear power accident in Fukushima was approved by the IRB of the University of Tokyo, where I belong. The final report was published by the Japan Medical Association in 2014. Next, please. The purpose of this study was to analyze the right to health issues in the post-compound disaster from victims and health providers' viewpoints. Next, please. For a qualitative research, we used a grounded theory by conducting focus group discussions with 28 Fukushima mothers from home groups who lived outside the evacuation zones <coughs> and conducted continue to live in Fukushima, and evacuees who originally lived three to five miles from the reactor and were under mandatory evacuation, living 200 miles away from home. Next, please. For quantitative research, we conducted a self-administered survey to Fukushima mothers. We also interviewed health providers and government officials from two dozen organizations in nine locations. Next, please. The mothers of the evacuated groups had a median age 44 years old. The home group had 37 years old. We observed dynamic situations. This picture is a machine that tests radiation dose in food and liquid. After two years from the disaster, mothers still brought their breast milk to test to test it. A young mother who lived 30 miles away from the nuclear reactor said, up to 10 minutes a day, I guess I can take my baby outside. The rumor says that radiation floats in the similar distance after two years from the disaster. Kindergartens limited up to 30 minutes outdoor activities for the children. Next, please. When we interviewed health professionals and government officials, we asked for one hour. However, most of them continued for over two hours, stating details of response to the large-scale and long-term disaster. A public health nurse who was being evacuated with other residents 200 miles away from home said, that from the afternoon of the disaster, she did not have much time paying attention to her own family needs. Being occupied with disaster response, evacuation, and providing health service to the evacuees for full two years. This study has strengths and limitations. For the strengths, as mentioned, we acquired situations from Fukushima mother's viewpoint regarding the right to health in the post-disaster. We also contrasted with the health provider's viewpoint. However, this study has limitations such as possible bias in recruiting mothers who participated in this study. The sample size was small and not generalizable to the whole Fukushima mother's viewpoint. Next, please. In addition, for the key points of human rights in the environmental health in Fukushima compound disaster. Next, please. We need to understand that there was a limited availability and accessibility to the actual radiation dose in the air, which was not obtainable at the Fukushima power plant at the initial stage due to the infrastructural damage and power outage after the earthquake and tsunami. 
I will focus on nurses as disaster victims, in addition to first responders, short and long-term health providers, and counselor to survivors. Next, please. Timing. The magnitude 9 earthquake hit at 2.46 p.m. Friday, March 11th. Tsunami followed approximately 30 to 75 minutes in the areas of 310 miles coastline. Next, please. With the height up to 134 feet, this is about 12-story building, in most areas with 30 to 50 feet tsunami. Next, please. Nurses secured patient safety, evacuations, hospital inpatients, and nursing residents, for example. Next, please. They secured healthcare goods and secured medical documents. Up to here is a normal response to earthquake tsunami disaster, except for an extremely large scale in magnitude and areas. Next, please. What makes Fukushima extraordinary is the series of nuclear accidents. All four reactors melted down or exploded in four days following the earthquake and tsunami on March 11th. The leakage of radioactive water is still going on as of today, according to the plant operator, TEPCO. Next, please. Japanese government declares a state of emergency at a nuclear plant on March 11th. The plant completely lost the power after the tsunami. They were desperate to cool down the reactors, despite all reactors ended up accidents. Next, please. While it is happening, the nurses in Fukushima secured pa patient safety, for instance, evacuation of inpatients from hospitals, hospitals and nursing homes. Next, please. And took preventive medical measures, for example, provision of potassium iodine. Potassium iodine is used to protect the thyroid from irradiation. Most nuclear accidents relate to the atmosphere, which can be absorbed into the body. When thyroid cells absorb too much radioactive iodine, it can cause thyroid cancer after the exposure. Babies and young children are at high risk. Therefore, it is recommended to take potassium iodine before or at the beginning of exposure. Mr. Eddie will discuss more about the radionuclides in the following section. Nurses in Fukushima provided potassium iodine to the applicable populations at evacuation centers without power or water, and people were still missing from earthquake and tsunami. Next, please. While all, while all these were happening, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster, at least 16 nurses died. Over 200 nurses left work, and another 200 nurses were on leave of absence in the first two months in the most disaster-affected areas in Japan. Next, please. After seven years from the compound disaster, Nurses took a part in health management survey that targets approximately 2.5 million Fukushima people with five types of surveys with free of charge. Next, please. For groups and individuals such as acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder at community centers, hospitals, nursing homes, and other places. Next, please. For example, public health nurses in Fukushima provided parenting counseling. Similar to our qualitative research results, 
child medical issues counted the top after the disaster. Next, please. Nurses pay visit at temporary houses, original homes, and other areas. They also participated in disaster recovery, rebuilding health care system. Next, please. The Fukushima nurses proactively engaged with preparedness for future compound disasters for planning, preparing, and drills. For, exa for example, they attached light on the yellow attached light on the yellow helmet from their experience that they lost power for a long time after the compound disaster. Next, please. They also disseminated their lessons to other areas, trained health providers such as nurses. The nurses revised the manual to have emergency bag designed to be carried on their back while helping patients. I actually Googled an emergency bag and found that it was sold online $120 for a bag with 36 items on Amazon Japan. Next slide, please. While the nurses are working day and night in post-disaster, the Japanese government took effort in evacuation instructions, decontamination of water, soil, food, and radiation dose tests such as whole body counter, water, food, and air. Next, please. However, there are some challenges for nurses in the post compound disaster. Next, please. First, it is a tremendously long-term environmental contamination. The left picture is the actual whole body counter testing in action two years after the disaster. The right picture is a Geiger counter, showing the radiation dose in the air was 31 times higher than the international standard. It was at a public park outside the evacuation zone where the two men were playing after three years from the disaster. Next, Tanks near the reactors are filled with highly contaminated water, produced 300 to 300 tons a day. Plastic bags with highly contaminated soil are piled up near the residential areas in the evacuation zones. Next, please. This is the current evacuation map after seven years from the disaster. 13 miles from the nuclear plant shaded in pink is the no entry zone with 50 millisievolt per year or higher radiation dose in the air. The international standard is one millisievolt per year. There are still 70, 73,000 evacuees of them over 50,000 are Fukushima people. About 70% are still being evacuated outside Fukushima. The challenge for nurses is that how to provide health care for prevention of disaster-related morbidity and mortality. Next, please. Another concern in the post-nuclear disaster is the health outcomes of children. 116 children were diagnosed with thyroid cancer among over 300,000 Fukushima children. For your reference, in the case of Chernobyl, nuclear accident in 1986, 39 times more thyroid cancers were diagnosed among the children 10 years after the accident. Next, please. Turning to Japan, the investigation committee's final report on the government failed to give proper instructions to the public. It was a profoundly man-made disaster that could and should have been foreseen and prevented. Now I pass it to Mr. Ed. Next slide, please. 
Thank you, Dr. Sase. She's actually done the heavy lifting, and now I'm going to give you a little lighter version of an overview of hazard vulnerability assessment and what it means to all hazards preparedness with the Fukushima comparator. Next, please. I thought you'd like to know that I began my career shoulder to shoulder with public health nurses in the field, in the trenches, in a traditional environmental health program, which is uh, tightly connected to food safety, uh, water, wastewater treatment, vector control, institutional and school safety, and of course, disaster preparedness and emergency response. We spent a lot of time in the housing program, uh, removing neglected children and abused elderly uh, from unsafe environments with the nurses. And the nurses really kind of taught me as a trainee about environmental health. They were naturally experts, it seemed, uh, and they shared their philosophies with me. And I carried those philosophies forward into two uh, leadership positions in public health, one supervisor, the other director in large metropolitan areas. And in between these two positions, you might be interested in knowing that I worked for the Department of Energy at a national priority list Superfund site where all of the hazardous wastes and materials were radioactive. Mm -hmm. So we characterized that material and figured out how to ship it off-site for disposal. And I didn't know until later in my career, post 9-11, that uh, those skills would become very useful in the new age of counterterrorism preparedness. And I did become the chairman of one of the first ever all hazards uh, consequence management and cold zone monitoring strike forces in the nation. And our structure was actually shared nationally, and many other uh, agencies patterned their programs after ours. I was appointed by the governor to the Ohio Public Health Council, a seven-member uh, advisory board to the State Board of Health, and that was a great honor for me. My third phase in public health, if you will, was in research and in teaching, and I have worked for three universities where I've been a subject matter expert in disaster preparedness, and I built curriculums at two of those universities and lectured on environmental health, global health, one health, and environmental health, of course. Next frame, please. So today, I'll be discussing very briefly an integrated all hazards universe, which has several components. And I will be referencing something most of you are probably already familiar with, uh, what I consider to be the most important acronym, CBURN. Uh, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and sometimes explosive, although that's more likely a law enforcement uh, purview. Um, I'll be talking about consequence management as it focuses on at-risk populations and the protection and preservation of public health and essential infrastructure, with the hazard vulnerability assessment being a traditional and major tool in helping you to identify your geographically located community vulnerabilities. And a vulnerability is the target because that is the piece we can modify. We can reduce or eliminate from the equation pre-event uh, to hopefully keep from happening what happened in Fukushima, Japan. The tabletop and functional exercise is something that I'll emphasize. Again, the nurses are really experts in environmental health. They need to be at the table, the planning table. And I'll encourage each of you to find your plate to be there and to participate in those exercises because, in my mind, that is the one way you can be confident that you'll be competent in an emergency response. Next frame, please. Next frame, please. I recently taught a class uh, that was a disaster theory course that had several uh, senior-level FEMA employees in it, and, uh, and they were surprised that their own mission statement actually emphasizes all hazards without the hyphen you might notice here. Next frame, please. The National Health Security Plan, which was published in 2015, does an excellent job of discussing an all hazards approach by describing a full range of threats and hazards, including domestic terrorist attacks and human-caused accidental and intentional uh, disruptions and other emergencies. Next frame, please. And why is that important? because there are so many different descriptors of crisis. And I can tell you this is always a fun exercise for students to list as many as they can and to try to identify which are actually practiced and which are actually required by law. The public health emergency of international significance is particularly interesting. It's governed by the international health regulation through the World Health Organization. Next frame, please. 
public health emergency is described well by, again, the National Health Security Plan. And if you haven't had a chance to look at that plan, I would read it. I think it's very important, perhaps the core driver now, other than the national response framework with FEMA and Department of Homeland Security. But again, we see an acronym here, uh, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear events. And why is that important? Because it's important to group your hazards in those general categories and start thinking about multiple consequences mm -hmm. and how they can be addressed in bulk. And why is that important? Next frame, please. Because there are so many hazards. And we can't possibly prepare for all of these hazards individually. As a matter of fact, there are many uh, people in the uh, disaster risk management business who scoff at the idea of all hazards. It's impossible to be trained for all hazards. That may be true, but it is possible to be trained for all types of consequences. Next frame, please. Next frame, please. So the hazard vulnerability assessment I'm going to touch on very quickly. Um, I will share my favorite description of all hazards, though, natural, accidental, NATEC, which means natural, technological, which is exactly what happened to Fukushima, and you heard Dr. Sase already mention that, and, of course, the infamous intentional. Next frame, please. 2015 Hyogo framework is considered by many professionals to be the new gold standard for disaster risk reduction. You'll hear that phrase a lot. Uh, the uh, framework almost screams at the reader uh, to stop trying to, to prepare for the management of disasters and to focus instead upon the risk of the hazards and how they'll affect those who are vulnerable. You can see that uh, it requires the discussion and interest in the dimensions of vulnerability, capacity, exposure of persons and assets, hazard characteristics, and the environment. And that's exactly what we advocated in a paper that we'll share some details with you here in a minute. Next frame, please. This is, again, Kaiser Permanente's Hazard Vulnerability Assessment Template. I was trained with this years ago. It still exists exactly like this. You can go onto their website, you can see it, and it explains it well. This is not the only way to go, and this is really a ranking process where we prioritize those expected hazards in your community, and you can go about preparing your plans. And you can see they have an interesting equation on the bottom that risk equals probability times severity. And if we had a little more time to talk about uh, this subject, I would really love to go into new formulas that are more advanced than that. Next frame, please. This is the cover of our 2015 publication on the Fukushima nuclear disaster. You can see on the cover it says implications for all hazards planning. Uh, we took that very seriously. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sase has already said, we've been working on this now for seven years. Uh, we never imagined back in 2015 that we'd still be talking about an ongoing event. Next frame, please. In the process of our research, we discovered, this will look familiar to you, that there are many uh, descriptions of a disaster or of an emergency. I like to use the term crisis. I many times use the term event, just so that I can speak broadly about things. Next frame, please. This is an interesting diagram that I'm guessing most people have not seen. Uh, this is the International Association of Atomic Energy, uh, Stockholm. They put together a expected pathway of radionuclides as they evolve through the environment after a catastrophic release from a nuclear power plant, just as had happened at Fukushima. It's interesting, I'm sure, that the nurses will appreciate this movement of radionuclides through the seawater onto the beach sand, the fishing nets, the boat decks, uh, into the marine animals and plants, and then to eventually contaminate humans uh, through internal and external means. You see a list, a short list of radionuclides. Dr. Sase mentioned that iodine is one of the first to be concerned about, a very short half-life and immediate concern, um, a, a matter of weeks. Uh, basically, it's no longer toxic to humans. But we also have strontium. We also have cesium. We also have plutonium, which all have much longer half-lives uh, into the dozens of years all the way into the thousands of years. Hence the long-term nature uh, of this type of disaster. Next frame, please. In our research, we focused on the man-made hazards because they were the modifiable aspect of this disaster. And after the, well, at the onset of the radio radionuclear disaster, uh, those were the most harmful and the longest lasting. But we focused on the disaster trigger event. As Dr. Sase has already pointed out, we had an earthquake create a tsunami and which enabled the release of man-made hazards due to the power loss. Um, we then identified 
and the vulnerability factors that were in existence prior to the event. And next frame, please. This is the model that we constructed based around our discovery of the vulnerability factors. So the risk to environmental health is a product of the interaction of the disaster trigger event plus the man-made hazards times the vulnerability factors that we identified specifically, um, divided by the level of preparation and adequacy of response, which is really the modifiable aspect of this whole equation. Next frame, please. Regarding the, the vulnerability factors, uh, multi-reactor unit configuration. We had a, a vulnerability dense scenario. In other words, we had really concentrated our risk by putting six nuclear reactors very close to each other. Uh, since this event, the uh, National uh, Regulatory Council and other American uh, regulatory agencies have addressed this and they realize that this is something that they need to keep in mind in the future. The spent nuclear fuel pools were very dangerous. Uh, these are required to be kept under uh, circulating water cooling processes at all time. They lost power for nearly three weeks. Um, they are very, very uh, radio, radioactive. Uh, these are considered by many to be the most this is the most toxic material ever made by humans. Uh, and it also contained a MOX complement, which is mixed oxide, which contains up to 6% plutonium. Most people know that plutonium is very dangerous and has a very, very long half-life. Risk assessment was not, risk was not well communicated to the public. And it's not all of uh, TEPCO or Japan's fault, partly due to the fact that they did not have the technology necessary to to adequately register uh, or measure the radiation because of the many conflicting sources of, of energy in this case. We have spent nuclear fuel pools, we have reactors that they did not know at that time had completely melted down. There was too much competing data for the sensitivity of the equipment. So they couldn't really even understand the extent of the risk, which is a really big problem mm -hmm. for risk communication. Um, the Japanese did not have uh, a semblance of our incident command system. And many of you know who Ben Nims trained through the National Incident Management System. Uh, the incident command system is really your major tool. Uh, everybody's trained pretty much the same. And while I use the tool analogy, it means interchangeable, that people can do each other's tasks. Since then, Japan has become trained up in the incident command system. Next frame, please. So the environmental health impact was really largely unknown. And okay, next frame, please. Next frame, please. So you can see that the consequence management was a, a destroyed nuclear power plant. Several reactors completely destroyed. Next frame, please. This is an interesting diagram from an article from the National Environmental Health Association's Journal of Environmental Health. You see here 462 priority hazardous chemicals are represented by 130 facilities that uh, were inundated by the tsunami. Mm -hmm. So we have no idea what the uh, product of all this contamination really was, but it was spread throughout the island. Next frame, please a short list of the chemicals that were contained within these facilities. Talk about a, a something to be prepared for in the future. Next frame, please. This is an interesting diagram uh, through NHK News of the so-called uh, frozen wall attempt by Japan, uh, an ingenious attempt and a very expensive engineering feat to try to stop the flow of contaminated ground flow, groundwater into the Pacific Ocean. Um, the groundwater is flowing from behind a plant, from higher elevations, runoff from the mountains, that is then running through and around molten reactor cores, mm -hmm. becoming highly radioactive. And they have not been able to slow the flow significantly. They have slowed the flow some, but they have not stopped the flow of uh, radioactive water into the ocean. Next frame, please. So the lessons learned from a disaster planning perspective or an emergency response perspective is how complicated this kind of grandmother of all disasters really was. We had an earthquake, a tsunami, a toxicological uh, accident because of all the chemical spills, hydrometeorological uh, accident. Normally you have one descriptor for a disaster, right, where we have floods and subsidence of land. 
Uh, it was a fast fuse disaster, which can sometimes be the worst kind because you have no time to prepare. Mm -hmm. uh, we have short and long-term disaster consequences as a result, and especially with the irreversible n nature of some radiation in, in soil and in the water. It was a NATEC event, uh, technological, caused by a natural disaster. And of course, it was a radiological event. Next frame, please. So the man-made Chernobyl and Three Mile Island disasters remind the world that Fukushima nuclear disaster-like scenarios can be caused by intentional, such as terrorism, accidental, and natural disasters. Dr. Anderoko wanted me to mention that the design of the Fukushima uh, reactors uh, that failed was actually uh, one that is shared by 23 uh, reactors here in the United States. So it definitely uh, lessons learned are very translatable and uh, of concern for us as well. Next frame, please. So winding down on my section, I would again implore you as the experts in environmental health and public health to find your place at the planning table and to be involved in those tabletop and functional exercises. And uh, you know you can have all the planning manuals on your shelf that, that you need, um, but when the disaster happens, you really don't have time to pull it off and read it. Mm -hmm. And that's why the tabletop and functional exercise is your best mm -hmm. friend uh, to make you feel comfortable. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ender. Okay, thank you. So we're we're closing down, um, closing down. We're wrapping up uh, the, the the slide presentation so that we'll be able to um, answer some some questions of the, of the group. If you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, and this is an acknowledgement slide of. Um, people that were interviewed, um, as well as the Jap Japan Medical Association um, and uh, the Japan Medical Association Research Institute, the National Diet Library of, of Japan, and the Tokyo Metropolitan Library. Next slide, please. So um, wrapping up, I always feel like uh, we need a little bit of um, hope when we um, learn of some of the tremendous uh, risks and hazards that um, we live with. And um, this uh, is a guide. It's called the All Hazards Preparedness Guide, um, put out by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response. Next slide, please. Uh, this, is a, um, this has been updated since it was originally published. Uh, it is the All Hazards Approach. And you'll see elements of uh, what both Dr. Sassy and Chris Eddy talked about related to uh, the science, the service, the systems, um, convening to um, take an approach that will address any and all hazards that may be occurring at any given point in time. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, uh, another um, uh, resource uh, is ready.gov, and if you go into ready.gov, you'll see all sorts of tips on how to plan ahead and be informed. Um, there's also a specific section for kids. Um, uh, I do point out, however, that they have um, specifically um, identified separate Events. So we've got earthquakes, nuclear power plants, tsunamis, uh, and quite frankly, um, as Chris pointed out, oftentimes these are occurring simultaneously or in close proximity um, in, in a timeline. So um, uh, for those of us that are new to this information, it would be a good starting point uh, to look individually at those um, events that are more likely to occur where we live. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Chris also mentioned FEMA. Um, this, this video, which I did not want to uh, attempt to work uh, with technology on this for the webinar, but um, they have a cute little video that talks about important things to know before a disaster. Um, those of us in the world of public health know it's always better to prevent 
things um, than to try to fix them later. And uh, this was just published at the end of uh, last month. It's six things to know before a disaster strikes. And some of these things are to um, have a communication plan with your family, um, uh, you know, have uh, an emergency kit, uh, know where you're going to place your pet, things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this actually comes from um, uh, 2007, and I think it still is very, very pertinent. Um, nurses do play in a, a very important role in prevention or mitigation, so preventing a disaster or emergency, minimizing vulnerability um, to e effects of an event, preparedness, um, assuring capacity uh, within the community to respond effectively, to disasters and emergencies, um, responding, providing support to persons and communities affected uh, by disasters and emergencies. And Dr. Sassy talked uh, very uh, specifically about uh, nurses as victims, but also how nurses really reached out to those impacted communities. And then finally, nurses play an important role in recovery, uh, restoring uh, systems to their functional level after uh, the disaster or disasters. And I have to say for the record, I did not prompt Chris to say those kind words about nurses. It was a surprise to me. Next slide, please. So we're ready for questions and thank you for your attention. This is Jessica. I thank you so much for hosting and organizing as, as I had a delayed flight. I, I so appreciate this presentation um, and the knowledge that you're sharing. I'll kick it off with a question and then we can, we can certainly check the chat to see if our, our other participants have questions also. But uh, my guess is the answer is going to be I don't know just in, in hearing about the scope the scale and the suddenness of the disaster, but is there any sense of hospitals or providers that were outside or just on the perimeter of the disaster zone that then were contaminated as patients came in as, you know, there was chemical or radiological contamination? Was there any sense of that primary and then secondary uh, effect of the disaster or was it just as such a scale and suddenness that there's no sense of that? Thank you, Jessica. This is Erico. Um, according to the nurses who were from the evacuation zones, said that every time they wanted to send the patients outside the evacuation zone, the first thing the, the accepting hospital asked to the nurse was, was the patient screened with the radiation level. So they were very cautious not to receive patients above the the unsafe radiation level. Thank you. I think that, yeah, there was training preparedness. So thank you. Another follow-up question is, uh, I loved this idea when there was temporary housing that there were public health nurses visiting those homes. Do you have a sense of, you know, was it protocol-driven, the training of the nurses, the type of assessments and care they were delivering? For the um, temporary housing, houses, as the name says, it was designed to last for about two years because it was usually for the tsunami or flooding victims. But in this case, when Chris and I visited outside evacuation zones in Fukushima three years after, four years after, we still keep seeing temp temporary houses having residents in it. So um, I, I believe this is beyond what was written in manual because it was for two years or so to take care of, of the residents, temporary residents at the temporary housing. The, one of the concerns that Japan is now facing, especially for the elderly evacuees to the temporary housing or outside their houses, 
is the disaster related death which is the the death caused somehow by disaster and um it's particularly among the three prefectures affected by disaster fukushima has the highest number who died of the disaster related death so the nurses are particularly paying paying attention to prevent this kind of disease including psychological stress and physical health management. Thank you. I know there was some similar long-term expected housing. I don't want to monopolize. Were there other questions from the Annie group? This is Barb. Um, Christopher, can you, when I saw your um, definitions or components of vulnerability, um, what I didn't see, what there was anything related to the population. Can you kind of speak to that? I kind of was expecting to see vulnerability. We always think of it as vulnerable populations, but that wasn't part of um, what you had up there on the components of vulnerability. And you mean like social vulnerabilities then? I'm, I'm, I'm well, yeah, when we think of vulnerability, I would have, you know, in a disaster, I think of, all right, the elderly children, um, children with special needs, those kinds of vulnerable populations, folks in hospitals. But you were looking at the structure and other components of the um, physical environment, I think. That's true, and that was our scope. And, and it's a good question, okay. though. And, and something that's important to keep in mind is that this was not an impoverished area of Japan. Um, the, this just so happened to have happened in an area where most people have uh, have means, and so poverty is very often, you know, as you know, one of the biggest uh, considerations when we talk about vulnerable populations, uh, at-risk populations, your functional needs populations, which I, I generally try to group together and discuss all at once. I will tell you though that the Hugo uh, framework, as I I, I did uh, mention, uh, goes into that uh, with considerable uh, detail. Um, and I think that part of the reason it's considered so special by so many people in uh, risk uh, uh, reduction is because of its emphasis on these um, uh, on the vulnerable populations. So, but not not necessarily something that we went into in great detail in the paper that we published. But you're welcome to have a look and see what you think. Okay, thanks. Probably have time for one more question. If there isn't anyone with a question, I have one for Erico. Um, so she mentioned the Amazon uh, in Japan kit for $120. What is in the kit? So if we want to make a kit for our families, what what should be in it, generally speaking? Um, a Geiger counter. A Geiger counter. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's kind of a joke. <laughs> That's a bad but joke. I, I have one mm -hmm. in my go bag. So. <laughs> um, and I would, I was also wondering, like with the potassium iodide, if that's something uh, that that can be purchased and and stored for any length of time, uh, and should be in case of you know in case of a nuclear event. Um, you know, with uh, with all the conversations. Around North Korea, I think it's uh, you know right in uh, the center of people's uh, thinking these days. So, what can you tell us about the kit? Well, thank you, Laura. I'm looking at the picture on page um, 39 of my slide. I don't know about your mm -hmm. today's slide, yeah. but we have so they have uh, food, water, mm -hmm. and the um, the um, cell phone charger with the handle that you can crank mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. and flashlight, mm -hmm. and toilet kit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Katie, every, everyone will have a link to the, the video, and hopefully um, on page, um, slide 39, there's a, there's a um, the photograph of the kit. Uh, and um, I have to say, in preparation for this, webinar, I decided to start putting one together for my home, and uh, a communication plan with my husband about our pets and 
other things. So um, I think probably a first step um, is for us to think about our own situations and then um, move beyond that to sort of our practice in our communities and how we might um, engage folks to be prepared. Right. So I'd like to chime in if I could. I will say that something I've thought about extensively is whether or not you have transportation and to have kind of a backup yeah. plan, to have like a heavy go bag in case you have a vehicle that mm -hmm. has your canned food in it and things mm -hmm. like this. And always have your can opener, by the way. I stress out about can openers. <laughs> you can't get into a can, it's a problem. But in lighter weight go bags, if you're on foot, you know, and, and you know, again, if you leave in a car and you get uh, in a situation, depending upon the type of uh, emergency that you're caught within, uh, you may have to give up the car at some point mm -hmm. and leave on foot. Mm -hmm. So then you'd want to think in advance uh, what would be packed in your portable go bag as opposed mm -hmm. to kind of a heavier travel go bag. So so having multiple go bags is probably the way to go mm -hmm. and to think about that. And adding that, that the tsunami picture I showed you had cars in tsunami, and that cars had people who were evacuating, okay. to remind you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you go into the CDC site, they'll talk about stay in place, uh, shelter in place, and... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, have a, have a lot of tips for folks, um, and I had a friend in Galveston who did that and actually made out better by staying sheltering in place. So um, I think we're at at the uh, the hour. Chris, were you going to say anything? We are. You know, I was I, just going to. A quick, if I, if you just go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Well, what I'm going to add is, is not terribly important. Um, I was just going to point out that from again a Seaburn perspective, you know, always have your N95 uh, paper mask in your back oh, too, right. just in case right. it's you know mm -hmm. it's some kind of biological event, right? Or and, mm -hmm. and goggles, goggles and, mm -hmm. and respiratory mm -hmm. protection. That's mm -hmm. all I had. Okay, that's important. Mm -hmm. Go and, ahead, Jeff. And just um Chris, in in your network and in and in your work, I'm not sure if you're aware, this is a research work group and you've tapped in two of us on the call here have done some work in simulation. Um I know Barb has as as I have as a content expert on a team um, and so in talking about those tabletop exercises and translating them into realistic training that's cost effective, a barrier that I've run into in some of the hospitals I've worked in or consulted in is the cost. And then even if you do a, a, a real live exercise, it never gets translated to off shift or you know, to personnel who might be there at 3 a.m. on a Saturday. And so the potential to do this in virtual reality, augmented reality, or simulation um, may be an exciting research opportunity for you to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you're interested in working with, with me and uh, Dr. Sase, we'd, we'd be delighted to uh, be of assistance in any way that we can be. I will tell you that I'm a little bit biased, and, and I really do favor the, the tabletop exercise because it's simple, it's inexpensive. You can put together a very imaginative, imaginative scenario um, that may seem unrealistic, but it really gets people to thinking. It puts people on the spot. Now, again, I'm not discounting the functionals or the other types of simulations. They're wonderful. But I think the tabletop should, be, should come first, and then you can develop your functional exercise uh, from, from the results of, of that experience. But certainly something, and again, you know, how, how wonderful would it be to build simulations based, again, on a Seaburn perspective where, you know, I mean, I think all – First responders are, are really worried about secondary attacks to the first mm -hmm. responder, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something that we worry very much about with any type of an intentional attack, is uh, the the booby traps, so to speak, left mm -hmm. for the responders. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's uh, something that that has happened and will happen. Um, so again, you know, kind of training for the possibility of a multi-modality type of attack uh, coordinated with a natural disaster. It sounds a little bit paranoid and a little bit out there, but something that could certainly happen. So, yes, if we can talk further, that would be great. We'll follow up by email, and thank you again. Uh, that's all I have to honor the time, and do so appreciate you being with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.